Lynn Fines, and I'm a member of the local CFUW, Brantford. So the Canadian Federation of University Women is an organization that was set up uh, 99 years ago, and there are 100 uh, clubs across Canada. We were set up to uh, improve the status of women and to advocate for social justice and public education and peace. And tonight we're very pleased to partner with the local RTO, the Retired Teachers Organization, to bring you your mayor oral candidates. So I will turn this over to Nora Futon, our moderator, and she will explain the process. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, I should say Lynn is also our timer, a very important lady. <laughs> when she puts up a yellow card, that means, hey, you're getting close to the line, and if it's red, it means, shh. <laughs> very close, depending on the question. And so before we start, I would just like to say uh, who our candidates are. Barbara Berardi was invited, but she has chosen not to come. So we have Kevin Davis, Chris Friel, Michael Issa, Wayne Ma, John Turmel, and Dave Robel. Now, you know, it takes a lot of energy to do what these people are doing, to run for office and to offer themselves in your service. So I, that's just welcome. This evening we'll be following the same format that we used before, if you've been at our debates before. All of the candidates have received three questions which have been chosen by the club, and they will have two minutes each to answer those questions. And then we also have two questions that were submitted by the teachers, retired teachers group, and uh, I'll give everybody uh, two minutes for each of those questions as well. You don't, you do not have those yet. They're a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and then we will be opening the, to the floor. And the way we would like to do this is you were offered a paper and some pencils and so forth when you came in. If you have a question, we ask you to write the question down, and those questions will be gathered and sorted at the back of the room. Obviously, with this number of candidates in only two hours, we don't have time to cover absolutely everything, so they sort of scream it a little bit that way. And something we're going to try a little differently tonight, if you wish to address your question to only one or two or three people, uh, feel free to indicate that on the question, and uh, we'll follow that through. Uh, if, if anybody else has some more wisdom to add to it, they would be allowed to do so. But if you want to particularly ask one or two or three people one of your questions, uh, please make a note of that on your written question. So, I think that pretty well covers everything for the introduction. So. To begin with, we're going to have an opening statement from each candidate. I have a bunch of sheets here, so I'll constantly be jumping back and forth as to who goes first. But for the opening statement, it is in alphabetical order. And so I will be asking, first of all, Kevin Davis, two minutes. Thank you, Lynn. So I'd like to thank the CUFW for organizing tonight's debate. So I I grew up in Calgary, and I guess because this is University of Women's Club, I better tell you what my what I did yeah, in terms of university qualifications. So I went to University of Calgary. I didn't I didn't major in uh, calf roping or spear wrestling, but I did uh, take an uh, honors degree in economics, and from there I went to Queen's University, where I attended law school. So after the Calder Bar, I came to Bramford in 1981, uh, looking for a place to build a career and start a family. You know, I was very lucky to join the firm Watchers Hold and Amy Hitch on. Uh, five generations of lawyers, and, and I was mentored by the senior lawyers that uh, it was very important for our firm to give back to the community. And that was similar to what I learned when I was uh, growing up with my parents and grandparents. They taught me the importance of giving back, helping out, making a better community. And so as a lawyer, I've helped thousands of people from all walks of life deal with some of their most important and pressing problems. 
And I've led many community groups such as the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Brant United Way, Rotary Club Sunrise, the YMYWCA Housing Corporation, the Bradford Aquatic Club, Boys and Girls Club. And, you know, working with those people, we did a lot of great things. And that's what I really enjoyed about those organizations, the team approach. So in the 1980s, I was on council for six years, uh, served under Mayors David Newman and Karen George. You know, I learned what a council can do when it comes together as a team. You know, we did some really great things in that council. We built that dike system that uh, was abused this past winter. Uh, we developed it the first steps towards the Northwest Industrial Park. And we also converted the, the old local building, that dates me, doesn't it, local building, uh, into the library. So now I want to take the next step, and that's to resign from my 37-year career as a lawyer and serve as Brantford's next mayor. You know, Brantford's an amazing city. We've had a remarkable past. I think we have a bright future. And, but we need the right kind of leadership to take us into that future. We have to be smart about how we spend taxpayers' money. We need to build a strong foundation so city services and infrastructure are in good shape for the present. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> uh, the next one is Chris Friel. I'd like to begin to apologize by those of you down this, and I've been suffering with a cold, and uh, I really apologize uh, before I begin. Um, I, uh, I've been mayor of the city of Brantford for 17 of the last 24 years, and during that time we have seen a remarkable transformation in our community. Even just our downtown, from being the worst downtown in Canada, to now having uh, 3,500 students through university and college, small businesses that are operating. But even still, that is a product of our success, and now we are in a position where our success has started to breed other issues, and we need to stand up and start to address those issues in our downtown where we're seeing dangerous, illegal, mischievous, or harassing behavior. As a community, we can stand up very strongly and say, enough is enough, we're not accepting this any longer. Brantford has uh, consistently had one of the lowest unemployment rates over the last number of years, and we have attracted full-time, good-paying jobs. Our biggest problem right now is matching the skills needed to the skill set of the unemployed. And that's one of the reasons that we started Graduate Brantford. We lobbied and attracted Go Transit, which is so necessary for our future. And after demonstrating the success of Go Transit over a short period of time, we will begin to lobby for a north-south route. We completed the boundary adjustment agreement with the county as a partnership for prosperity, where all the partners benefit, and we carried that on with recent agreements and improving services and finding efficiencies and sharing our emergency measures coordinator position, parks and rec master plans, transit master plans, etc. We're finding more and more opportunities to be able to work together. The biggest issue that Brantford faces right now is our own success, as seen in the growth happening in all corners of our city. Growth and how we adapt to change will be the key factors for the next 10 years. I have the experience, knowledge, and the vision that helped create the success and will move us toward being a 21st century city of choice. Thank you very much, Chris. And now we come to Michael Issa. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me tonight to this important debate. And I thank the committee for seating me in the middle as if they know my political views. <laughs> I'm not a left winger, and I'm not a right winger. I'm right in the middle, but I have the good quality of both. I have the fiscal responsibility with compassion. My name is Michael Issa, and I'm delighted to be with you tonight. Your invitation gives me pride, happiness, and joy. Sitting among you tonight is my beautiful wife of 47 happy years. Gary. <laughs> who helped me raise a family and keeps me going. Some many chauvinists say they are the head of the family. But I say the woman is the neck that holds that head. <laughs> True to my faith, I will always remember the words, together till death do us part. I have been branded, branded by my, the, my contenders whom you have seen on this podium over and over before. In the business world, we call them repeat customers. 
as I was branded as the unpolitician, the retired executive, and that my election signs depict the philosopher, which is all true. But the real truth is, I am one of you, and I would like to serve you. This evening, and from this stage, I am reverberating to you the will, the will of the people. And for the first time in the history of Brantford, I will introduce term limits, giving a chance to a wider spectrum to serve at City Hall. Thank you very much, Michael. I am... Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid your time is up. Sorry. Uh, can you pass the mic over now to Wayne? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm the one who uh, originally had uh, sat down with my team of people for many years uh, back when we had the drill bus here and I was doing some marketing planning for Brantford. The two walking links for West Branch and uh, uh, Sharon Cross had, uh, was uh, the first ones that got started with uh, more, uh, the medical field issues going on. As for the SBCA, I was a member, a volunteer member for that for four years until the downtown store was closed down. Uh, we we're very disappointed how that happened. I'm working, I'm still working on a lot of projects to get this uh, the, um, going. On more projects, I have more things up my sleeve uh, to get things off the ground. As for the Globe Bus, it is a great improvement. Years ago, there was a uh, train that used to go from here to Kitchener. Um, no longer. As for the uh, train, uh, the CN, for the GO train, it's way out of the question. It's very costly, and there's been issues with the Red River, uh, Red Hill. Uh, river uh, with the decaying. We were still working on a bunch of stuff with that. I worked with a lot of committees out of the community for many years. I resided back here in 2014. I have been in London, Ontario for many years, up to 2014. Uh, 13, I should say. Then I reached, uh, we went to uh, Kitchener and sat down and we went through a bunch of stuff at the Gold Bus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wayne. And now we'll hear from John Termel. Who doesn't think that paying kids with bus tickets to shovel your snow isn't the smartest idea you've ever heard of? <laughs> In history. Every city could do it, every town could do it. Paying kids with bus tickets to clean the parks, no more dog doo-doo on your shoes. And people could, the real workers could be filling up potholes. So, four years ago I started a new site, smartestmanonearth.ca, smartestman.ca for short. And that's my idea, paying kids with bus tickets. Now, eight years ago, we were at a school, right Chris? And I asked the kids, how many of you kids would work for six $2 bus tickets an hour? Did you see any kids say no? They loved it. Matter of fact, walking out, he said, you won them. Well, guess what? No media allowed. Therefore, nobody found out that all the kids were ready to show your snow. Well, I got videos where I interviewed 100 kids said, would you shovel in snow and clean the parks for bus tickets? And 100 kids said, yeah, only one said no. Probably rich kid or dumb, one or the other. But it's at YouTube. YouTube for it, bus bus. Matter of fact, Chris's son, Connor, last video, said, yeah, I'd work for bus bus. But nobody knew about it, so they didn't vote for it, so you're still shoveling your own snow. Now, someday the kids are going to ask, why didn't you vote to give us jobs paid with bus bus? And you're going to have, A, I didn't know about it. We'll put you under an uninformed. B, uh, I got a reason, but I can't really tell you what it is. So, the point is, I got you trapped. I've offered you the smartest idea in history two times already. 
And some of you people already said no twice. And this is your third chance to reject the smartest idea in history. So the next time you're out, you know, you got an excuse. First town in the country with fluoride. Next time you're shoveling your snow, imagine Johnny Engineer laughing. Last. Thank you very much, John. And finally, Dave Rebell. Always such a tough act to follow. <laughs> Ladies of the Canadian Federation of University Women, North Park Collegiate, fellow candidates, guests. I'm a husband, 29 years to my lovely wife, Sherry, a father to my daughter, Cassidy, who is here with me this evening, and my son, Cody. I'm a carpenter who has served the construction industry for 32 years. I go to work every day, long hours, hard work, to earn a pay, to pay my bills and my taxes, just like you. I've had the honor of mentoring students for 16 years in the skilled trades. I've had the privilege of serving as a Ward 4 counselor for three terms between the years of 2000 to 2014. I've been an advocate and a volunteer to our community for more than 21 years, and I have done that actively, even in the years I was absent from council. My education is in skilled trades and business, so I bring a breadth and a depth of information, knowledge, and experience as a candidate for mayor. We have built four pillars based on our community consultation, going door to door. And we're not just talking about in this election, we're talking about previous elections, and we're talking about the mayor's campaign in 2014. I did not let this go. It was dogged determination that brought me here again to be a candidate to serve this community. Those four pillars, municipal money management, covering from four-year budgets to bringing our taxes under control and reducing our debt. Community and social services, programs that are built on made in Brantford solutions by people like you and I, the professionals that facilitate industrial development. Want to look at development and infrastructure from small housing initiatives for our seniors and first time home buyers and accountability, recorded minutes, recorded meetings, 12 month, four cycle calendar for everyone to work every day. Thank you very much, Dave. Okay, that's our opening statements, and now we will move to the first question, which the club had chosen. Uh, the candidates have seen these questions before. We'll do it in a different order this time. Uh, there's two minutes allowed for each question. And the first person to answer this question uh, will be John, but don't stand up yet, I haven't read it. Uh, the question is, the past few years have seen a rapid increase in traffic on Brantford streets, especially on major thoroughfares such as West Street and Linden Road. This increase has been accompanied by deteriorating driving practices, especially speeding, racing red lights, and dangerous left-hand turns into oncoming traffic. Driving and walking in the city are therefore often hazardous. So the question, what measures would you undertake to improve safety for drivers and pedestrians in the future. John? I would match the advanced lights with the extended lights. How many people have sat at St. Paul turning right, I mean, at Brant Avenue turning right on St. Paul under the overpass? Can't turn on a red light while the other guys are going. Don't you feel stupid? I do. There's absolutely no reason we shouldn't be able to be turning right on an extended while they're turning left on an advanced, right? There are a dozen spots in Brantford where you don't have matched lights. North Park Road and Fairview, right here, you don't have matched lights. Church Street, you know, West Street at uh, Charing Cross, they're all over the place. How can you sit there and have red lights for you, while the other stream going in the other direction has an advance or an extended. Somebody at the planning department wasn't doing their job very brightly. So, yes, there's no reason we don't need more roads, we don't need more cops ticketing people who are cutting turns quickly to try and make it on those few seconds since the time was taken away. We just got to match the lights and then we have maximum efficiency. So. Match the lights so that 
I could be going while the other guys are going and there's no danger and we're going to have a lot better traffic stream and maybe the problems will disappear. Thank you very much, John. Our second answer will be Chris Friel. Oh, yours is shaking this up so we have no idea. Oh, oh no, oh, that's nice. Okay, now we're engaged yet because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I've spoken many times uh, about the fact that we have an incredible amount of growth that's happened in the city and that we need to start looking at ourselves as a large urban municipality. In fact, since 2006, we've grown uh, by 8,000, just over 8,000 people in uh, about 12 years. That's a lot of new cars, that's a lot of new people, that's a lot of congestion on our streets. And it's happening not just in the southwest where people like to focus their attention, and that is the concept of how do I get out? of the city. Uh, it's also for those who are coming into the city and congestion is happening everywhere. We're talking Fairview Road, Linden Road are good examples. So we've attempted over the last couple of years, a uh, number of years of this term of council to look at different ways of being able to affect change and make things safer. So we've trust, uh, tested uh, traffic calming on Tranquility and Parkside. We've tested the road diet on North Park Street, which is very, very popular with the neighbors. Uh, but for those individuals who still have the idea that they can get across or should by right be able to get across the city in 10 minutes um, <laughs> Don't like it at all And it does slow people down and now we're starting to see the cycling uh, happening as well We also try removable uh, rubber speed bumps on Clench Ave uh, Which has also been popular in that neighborhood We should start looking at roundabouts in key areas because it does uh, move traffic more effectively um, we have key intersections that we know are consistently high on the, um, on the traffic accident count and we can make major, or we should be making major investments into uh, changes in those uh, intersections. We also need to take a look at an immediate process of being able to deal with the traffic in the southwest. Instead of looking at a plan that was designed in the 1950s, approved in the 1970s, and then again in the 1980s, um, we should be looking at a plan more along the lines of moving on Rest Acres Road I gotta finish. Uh, Rest Acres Road and come in partnership with the county. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dave Robel. <clears throat> Surprise. This is not a Brantford issue. This is an everywhere issue. It comes from every community. It's a human nature problem. People will drive because they're accustomed to driving. And a good example would be posted speed limits are 40 kilometers an hour and they go 50 and the list continues to go on. Slowing down and rolling through a stop sign and passing through a stoplight to make a quick right hand turn without looking at what's at your left. Factors that affect driving from pedestrian safety, drivers who have a certain level of experience, paying attention, cell phones, that's both drivers and pedestrians, got to start to change the human element. Now. What can the community do? Well, let's look at examine other communities and pilot projects. Do a cost-benefit analysis. What's effectively working here? What's effectively working there? And pull those ideas ahead. School safety zones, speed bumps, traffic calming measures. They work, but they also create havoc for our staff and employees who use the uh, snow removal. Red light stop cameras. Set up dozens of boxes and cameras. So an example, 50 boxes, 10 cameras in your road, take the cameras around. It's called driver beware. Those are projects that can be implemented and used in our community. They become deterrents. But those are the deterrents that change the human element. And it's the deterrents that we have to change our conditioning. And basically, there's, a, there's some facts that go with changing a habit takes somewhere between 28 and 268 days to change a habit. Can you imagine the work we have to do as a community to change the habit of hundreds of drivers to behave and be cautious about our children and our youth, about our seniors who are crossing the roads, about the other drivers who are around? The other one that we seem to miss, and I'm hoping we can improve on, is community education. And maybe that's a course where individuals get re-educated and additional testing for those drivers. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dave. And now we turn to Kevin Davis. All right, first of all, I'm going to be in trouble. I forgot to introduce my wife, Lisa, who's here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
So this is the most frequent question I get when I go around the city. I've been to 11,000 doors, and this is the number one question I get, whether you're on a major street, a secondary street, or a side street. You know, and I've seen it up close myself, going through the city. I've had a couple of close calls with drivers speeding around corners, running red lights, uh, stop lights. And so what most people tell me is they want more traffic enforcement, which means they want an officer on their street. And we know that's really not realistic. The police department is the largest city department. It's $32 million. If you're concerned as I am about property tax increases, you realize that we really can't add to the officer component. And we don't want to take officers away from who, who are dealing with more serious crime. But I think there's some things we can do to create better traffic enforcement within the current budget. One is uh, hiring civilian personnel to do some of the minor tasks that sworn personnel do, safety audits, minor investigations, and they're paid much less as sworn officers that would free up time for traffic enforcement. Absolutely red light cameras at high, tra high traffic accident intersections. Hamilton and many other communities do that. I think we should even consider, and this is controversial, petitioning the provincial government for photo radar. Those are techniques that you can use to enforce traffic law without the use of an expensive constable. Um, another thing I found confusing in this city is, what's the speed limit in any one street? Is it 40? Is it 50? Is it 60? It's hard to figure that out because we don't really have a consistent speed limit. So I would say, let's have 40 kilometers throughout the city. It's not posted at 40K. And then have special zones, safety zones, schools, 20K. And then if it's posted on major roads, it would be anywhere from 50 to 70. So I think that would help release, uh, eliminate some of the confusion. The other thing is the traffic calming measures. Staff have done some really creative things. An example would be North Park Street. When I canvassed here, I thought, okay, what have they done to the street? I mean, it's like a maze. But then when I talked to the people in the street, they told me, this is great, it calms traffic, so we should continue that. Thank you very much. The next one is Wayne. Well, we have, like, like these uh, gentlemen said, that there is a major problem. It's been in every city. I have been in many cities myself, uh, like Dr. Branker. Um, that we do have a cell phone, a cell phone problem. They're drinking. There's uh, other sorts of drugs, uh, pills, uh, marijuana, whatever. Um, that the drivers are behind the wheel. Uh, they're not paying no attention. Now in area, there are blind spots. I fire in area. Uh, uh, yeah, area. There are blind spots, you come looking around the corner, the people come looking around the corner, and they don't see the people crossing the street, which uh, this, we have to, the waters do have to run away to go across the street. I've been almost nailed a couple times from the underground parking lots. They come with me out of the parking lots, they don't pay no attention, it's right, it's right behind the library. Um, there's other areas uh, in this community, I focused on many, on the whole city, uh, took uh, just a few hours to go through the whole thing. And back in uh, 2014, when I came back to Brantford, it was so simple for me because I came from a bigger town. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And finally, Michael. I believe the real problem uh, for the city is the unanticipated growth of the population. The real estate is very attractive to the outside world in Brentford. People from Toronto, they sell for a million. They come buy a good, nice property for half of uh, a million and pocket half a million in their pocket. So that's the, the growth was unanticipated. So we really need more highways, uh, especially from West Brand. You have West Brand growth is phenomenal. Building and building and building to no end. We should have limited the issuing uh, permits to build and work on the infrastructure to handle the growth before we issue those permits. If the uh, speeding is a problem, I think we should put more police officers on the roads. And that will take care of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So now we turn to the second question that the committee has chosen. And uh, the, uh, no surprise there. 
Uh, the candidates already know these questions. This one is two minutes per person. There has been much talk about the need for improved health care in our community. What would be the three most important criteria for you in making decisions about the future of hospital facilities for Brantford and Brant County? Okay, I'm going to talk fast because I never seem to be able to finish answering my question. So, so we have a big problem with long-term care in this community. We've got more than 600 seniors waiting to get a bed at a, at a nursing home. Some seniors wait two years to get in a home. So, so what happens? Many times we're in the Brantford General and they're using beds that are better used or should be used for acute care. We, we just heard an announcement this morning that provincial conservatives are going to be, I think it's 16,000 beds in the next uh, five years. So as mayor, I would pressure the provincial government to make sure that we get the fair share of our long-term care beds here in Brantford to take some of the pressure off our hospital. Third, secondly, we have to listen first to what the hospital wants. Now I'm talking about a new hospital. I don't think there's anybody up here who doesn't want a new or improved hospital. However, already deciding where that hospital will be and what it will look like, that's a bit premature. And I think what we have to do is consider that the hospital's regrouping uh, under new management. That process needs time to work itself out. Once it's worked itself out, I'm sure we'll hear from the hospital uh, what it is that they foresee needing a new facility. So we really need to hear from them first before we start planning what it is they need. And the other third criteria is a new hospital is likely 10 to 15 years away. I think we have to focus on the short term, what it is the hospital needs now. The hospital has announced a revamp of the emergency department. It's been approved by the Ministry of Health. That's going to cost, the, but to do construction costs, province pays 90%, local community has to come up with 10%. And I'm told the cost of the, of, for the ER department, local contribution, about $5 million. You know, the, the hospital foundation is struggling given the problems the hospital has had. If we cannot come up with a 10% for the ER department, we're never going to see a new hospital. So my solution would be we use some of the money that comes to the Brantford Charity Casino, $5 million a year, some of that be allocated towards the ER department, because after all, that money is for the use of the city, not just the city government. Thank you very much. Well spoken. <laughs> and the next one is Mike Hawk. Uh, this is an easy question for me. I come from the business world and I'm a computer professional. I put brains into machines and I manage projects. Uh, what we need, the three steps that we need, is obviously we need to expand our health facilities, whether expanding the current uh, hospital or building a new one. There are three steps to do that. Step number one, assessing the health needs. Exactly what do, what, what, what do we need for the health. Number two, determine its resources and assets for promoting health. Number three, developing and implementing a strategy for action and establishing where responsibility should lie for specific results. That's three major steps that we should follow to solve the health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And now it's John. 36 years ago, I was arrested passing up flyers at the IMF World Bank Conference in Toronto saying, why don't we pay government employees with tax credits, bonds, Provincial bonds, federal bonds, municipal bonds, anything they can use to pay their taxes with. Three years later, six provinces in Argentina started paying their employees with bonds because they were broke and it worked. And in a few years, they paid off all their foreign debt by using local currency. So, here's how it works. If we were to pay hospital employees 10% of their salaries in tax credits, that frees up 10% of the cash to pay for the operating room. Or 20%. Same with police. We could have more police by getting them to accept 10 or 20% in local city bonds they can spend instead of cash. That frees up cash to hire more police. Same thing with firemen. 
all government employees could do the Argentine solution, which is take government bonds or tax credits in your pay, and that frees up cash to hire more guys. Well, if it worked for the Argentinians, can't we be that smart too? Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Chris. Three criteria for um, uh, hospital, <clears throat> Branford and Brant, and Six Nations. Um, we already have a task force in place called the New Hospital for Brantford, which has representatives from the hospital who sit on it, as well as representatives from Brantford, Brant County, Six Nations, and we've invited new credit. We also have representatives uh, um, from other health organizations that have been involved. So the terms of reference that were in, uh, designed were done by these individuals. We are projected to grow by 63,000 people by 2043. Uh, it's 25 years from now. 33,000 of those people will be in the New North End, uh, Brantford, and 30,000 will be in the current settlement area. We've grown by 8,000 people in the last year. We can see it in our traffic, we can see it in our healthcare and in our hospital right now. And that is one of the most important factors is anticipating growth and where we're going to ultimately end up. Second key factor, geographic and cultural planning. We are the uh, center of uh, two other communities, uh, three if we add new credit. Um, why does Willet have to close? Why does somebody in Six Nations have to make a decision if they're having a heart attack 20 minutes this way or 20 minutes this way to get to a hospital? Um, in those scenarios, the opportunity should be there for all of our communities, particularly as they sit at the table. The last major criteria is cost and building a community first new hospital for Brantford relationship with the ministry and local health integration network or LINS. In fact, uh, donating the land or making the suggestion of having the land, which is a Spearberg farm, land we own on Powerline Road in the north part of the city, is actually one of the first criteria that the, uh, or, sorry, the province looks into. We have to be able to figure out if we are going to be able to handle the 10%, $800 million new hospital, 10% of that is what our three municipalities have to come up with. In the resolution that I moved originally, we asked for a review of that so that we don't have to, uh, uh, the municipalities don't have to carry such an unusual burden. Our hospital is in. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's an opportunity to have a couple word more. Name. <laughs> Dave Rebell, please. Three criteria budget, funding, resource allocation. Healthcare providers such as doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, etc., and the availability of those resources. And then the community growth and health needs. Those are the three criteria. But where do we go from those three criteria? Well, let's start looking at the continued operation of existing hospitals in our community. They need to be there and they need to continue to run. That's why we talked about the other elements of having the support from staff and professionals to provide that care. We want to make sure that we have partnerships in place that go beyond the federal and the provincial governments and the municipalities. We want to be able to look at our current hospital partnerships and we also want to continue to grow and prosper in the new idea or the idea of a new hospital for partnerships. Partnerships with other health care models such as the Hamilton Health Sciences. Drawing on those resources are incredibly important in this community because they offer specialties. And I'm now going to look at education within our hospitals, training for our nurse practitioners and our health care providers, looking at long-term care for our seniors, therapeutic care facilities, integrated systems, all important. But the last one that comes with it is the location. If we're going to build new, where? 100 acres of land north of Powerline Road, aka known as the Spearingberg Farms. But what do we need to do to establish a presence for the province? Well, let's start widening Powerline Road and plan for residential, commercial, and industrial development. But if we widen that road and put the infrastructure in place and we've identified those lands, we've already established a firm foundation and a commitment that we want the services for the hospital in that location because it will service people across the province, across, the province, across our area and our region. We need to update our official plan to accommodate for those needs as well. Thank you very much, Dave. And finally, we'll hear from Wayne. I've, uh, I'm a founder of an agency since 96. 
um, in London, Ontario. And um, the health care has gone down the tubes. Uh, many cutbacks, many layoffs, uh, you name it. It has not improved at all. The, uh, they, it, every time there happens to be an election that comes up, they always come up with these wonderful, bright ideas, as you notice. Um, Brantford is about 25, 30 years behind from the rest of the communities. I've seen it, I've been there, I've been so, uh, me, uh, so many meetings, been in so many hospitals, talking to uh, people that are dying on their deathbeds with cancer or whatever. I've uh, done enough to the communities uh, uh, to know that uh, the health care has gone down. In the media, uh, a while back, Brantford General had a poor rating. We need a new hospital built. We had St. Joe's Hospital years ago. Uh, we need a new one built. There was, at the last meeting I was at, this subject was brought up. Yes, I would agree to put a brand new hospital in this area to update. And uh, I would just leave that at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we come to the third question which the committee has set. <clears throat> Brantford citizens recently learned that the capacity of the city's pumping stations may be inadequate to provide for the residential, commercial, and industrial development now taking place. Some pumping stations are already reported to be operating at or beyond capacity. The current council's response appears to be to delay development projects. Do you support delaying development or are you prepared to take action by committing to the expenditure of funds that may require an increase in taxes? I find this a very direct question. Our response has never been to delay development and uh, quite honestly this is a misstatement of what happened. Uh, just last night we approved a development that flows through the empty street station for a new industrial area and there were no concerns. The issues that hit the media was more in line with the fact that we were, uh, just three years ago we got control of our entire uh, water, uh, sewage treatment water treatment system. Uh, we had a contractor, we moved that contractor out. During that three years we started a, an aggressive process of being able to do the studies. Um, what, we were, what we had to deal with, we've been dealing with uh, surcharges, etc. We have a very good knowledge of what was happening. We have known that the eastern side of our city has been weak since 1980 when we got the land in the southwest and the northwest and that is where all of the resources ultimately went. So when I came into office in 1994, it was interesting that we were always identifying that particular area as a weak spot. That applies to the lands in the northeast where Aritzia was. We had to make special compensation, special consideration for that to ultimately happen. The biggest problem that we had was miscommunication. We had municipal planners, municipal engineers talking to business people. That doesn't work, it's like talking two different languages at times. It's why I'm proposing a concierge-style program where we have business-minded individuals that facilitate this process, the red tape, for business people so we move through that. Uh, they don't have to deal with all of those elements. What happened in Emmy Street was a communication issue and that was our responsibility. Um, we were letting the people who regulate this department and who would set the tolerances on it do the ones that were selling to business and that was a mistake. When we brought it to council, we actually shifted it around. Uh, I insisted that we send out the copy of the report early to the business groups and we shifted uh, around how this was presented so staff could say, we had a short term solution, we had a medium term solution, we had a long term solution, we've been doing the studies and we've gone all the way through that entire process as well. Thank you very much, Chris. And now we turn to John Turnell. If only we had more money. <laughs> right? Back to not enough fun. Shall we tax you more? Well, if we had paid tax credits into circulation in exchange for work, like they did in Argentina, more taxes wouldn't hurt, would it? So, if there's more money that goes into circulation, more taxes doesn't hurt. So they're asking you, 
Are you willing to accept the hurt of more taxes? Because we're not going to put any local currency in circulation. Can we take more of your federal stuff? And guess what? You ain't got much more. So it is going to hurt. you got to think outside of the box. And I'm looking at the crowd here, and there may be only be under 10 people under 30 years old. Everybody else got so much gray hair thinking outside of the box. Forget it. You ain't done that in 20 years. And you're not going to start it now. Are you? But young kids, perhaps. Come on, I'm trying to urge you. Look at me. I'm an advocate for legal marijuana because marijuana regrows brain cells. That's why I'm so sharp and you're so dull. All right? So, it's not the only reason. And I'm trying to point out that you've got to think outside the box. You can't do what you always did all the time in the past and expect something different. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So, how do we get more money? Well, we can free up some of the budget by covering some of the expenses with our own local poker chips. Don't have my first poem in politics. Why represent our collateral with their chips for a fee when we can represent our collateral with our chips for free? So, yeah, back to the same solution. If we have alternate currency to pay part of the workers' salaries, that's going to free up more cash to get things you want done. Thank you very much, John. Outside the box. And now we'll turn it over to Kevin. Okay, John, I've, I've got it right here, and I can take it outside the box. <laughs> so, the city has uh, eight pumping stations throughout the city, and that's where parts of the city the sewage collects and needs to get a pump up 30, 40 feet to flow by gravity down to the Mohawk Street sanitary sewer system. You know, developers I've talked to suspected a long time that there's a serious problem. They were finding they were tapping into the top of the pipes leading into these two pumping stations rather than the side. I mean, if you're not tapping into the top, you're at capacity. But the city only realized about a year ago they had a serious problem. So what did they find? There's two of them. There's one in MP Street that services Brandlin and half of the boundary lands east of King George Road. And also the, um, and that's at 100% capacity. And they also, the Fifth Ave pumping station serves Eagle Place. And when it rains, it's at 123% capacity. And I went to the meeting. I'm not sure what's the capacity of pump. I don't know. When it goes past 100, you'd think it would fail. But I guess it doesn't. But it is a bit of a, a, a desperate situation there because at some point it might fail, and I'm sure that'll be a real crisis. So, but the good news is that uh, of the two pumping stations, one, the MP Street Station, Northeast, I understand the fix in that is going to take about a year. But the problem is the MP Street pumping station serving Eagle Place is going to take, we're told by city staff, up to five years. And you know, that's way too long. It's not fair to the residents of Eagle Place because until the pump is fixed, you can't develop because you've been put an unbearable load on the pump, and that makes sense to me. I think the MPC pumping station should be replaced much sooner. Residents in Eagle Place cannot get a building permit until that is fixed, meaning if they want to put a granny flat on with a toilet, they can't do it. That's not fair to Eagle Place. So what's the solution? One, uh, the when it's dry, MP Street's at 65%. When it's raining, it's 123%. So there must be water flowing in through storms, storm connections. Fix them. The other option is allocated property in the budget. Budgeting is all about priorities. If you give Eagle Place priority, you can juggle it to accommodate it without increasing taxes. Thank you very much, Kevin. And now we'll turn to Wayne. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you here. There has been a lot of delays on a lot of things. If you see it, you know that. Um, with these water problems. And um, just watch the media, that's what I would say. There's going to be some changes I would imagine over time. And now Dave for Bell. Thank you very much. Pumping stations and system capacity is not a new issue. It was identified by engineering staff in 2011 when there was an unsigned bylaw that cost a multi-million dollar development in this community. Those engineers of the day identified the need for that developer to build a pumping station to service his lands 
which, by the way, is the rail lands in, uh, right in behind uh, Sinclair Boulevard. There's about 28 acres between two parcels of land. That's close to the MP Street pumping station. They identified that in 2011. It was discussed with the developer that he would be required to pay for that pumping station. And yes, that developer agreed to that when the development time, time came forward. Now, I support moving forward with development in this community. It can be done sooner than later. We can't afford another shortfall or further sewer backs up as a result of capacity. You know, we get 100-year storms that are happening every three years. Something's wrong. We can do this without going to the taxpayers two ways. One, the developer pays for the new pumping stations and we lay that burden on them. Or we build new ones with the use of revenue from the recent sale of, of land for $33 million in West Brant. We can tap into that without coming to the taxpayers. Now there's also the existing infrastructure that we can deal with. We have that money there. We can put aside new projects or wants like a $55 million sports complex to service our infrastructure needs now. This is not an opportunity or a time to delay this, ladies and gentlemen. My experience in industry, my engagement with staff at those times when we were bringing those developers forward, we knew it then, we should have changed it then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. And finally, Michael. I think everybody knows this uh, proverb, money down the drain. Every time I open the tap, I think, oh my God, it's costing me money. And draining, costing me money too. And you want more taxes now? No way. There will be no more taxes. The, the, the builder, the developer, they should pay for the expansion of our pumping system. Do you know how much money a builder makes when they sell a house? I think we can tax them on that and save us the payment. Any builder that wants to build here and get a permit has to pay for the infra infrastructure. And this way we upgrade the pumping system and we save ourselves money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Now I have a question here from the Retired Teachers Organization. You haven't seen this question before. This is a shocker. Eh? Um, for these questions from now on, it's just one minute, okay? I know that seems short, but with this number of candidates and the number of questions, it's necessary. The World Health Organization has designated Brantford as an age-friendly community. What steps would you take to encourage and promote age-friendly community initiatives? Examples are housing, transportation, outdoor space, and downtown streets. So what steps would you take to promote an age-friendly community? And Dave will answer first. Wow, nice to be the first guy out the gate. I think one of the things that I've been a very strong advocate for is what I refer to as small housing projects, because this allows seniors who cannot afford to stay in their own home because of taxes or maintenance. These smaller types of projects, they run between 450 and 750 square feet. They allow them the opportunity to maintain them while still living the Canadian dream of independence <coughs> and home ownership. Are there other things that we can do? When we do our construction as home builders, we can continue to, instead of just doing government-based projects, where we have that barrier-free accessibility, because barrier-free accessibility isn't just about people with physical challenges, it's also dealing with the aged in our community. That should become a standard in new home construction. There are communities who are building homes now that are addressing the aged community in their construction regardless of what the barrier-free standards are set up or by the Ontario Disabilities Act. They're taking those steps. We can do that as a community, ladies and gentlemen. Those are just two fundamentals. Thank you very much. Wayne. The, uh, there is a uh, problem out there with the uh, retirement issues. Uh, they have lack of funds for uh, uh, for more advantage of what they need to have. Uh, for the uh, for the cutbacks that they had 
done on the seniors isn't fair. Um, they should put that right back in place um, on everything. The uh, home improvements uh, that they had done in the Brentford area is mainly coming from the Toronto area. Um, it is mainly coming from the Toronto area. That's why we have so much traffic coming here. That's why we have so many people going to the hospital. That's why we're having so many people going to the food store. Everything's coming for this way until the market crashes and what we do. I had pointed this out about the, uh, uh, the city last, last meeting. What happens if the market crashes and they're tied up with a building downtown? Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. And now we'll go to Kevin. Yeah, there's several things I can think of off the top of my head. So, one in terms of being friendly to seniors, that is assisting them in staying in their homes as long as they possibly can. And of course, taxes are a part of that equation. Uh, tax increases that run at double the rate of inflation make it difficult for those on fixed income to stay in their home. Uh, I have a plan of smart spending that is to restrain tax increases. The other issue is, and this is kind of exciting, it's these boundary lands we're bringing into the city. Uh, north of Powerline Road, and it's a blank slate. We're going to, the next council, some of the most important decision making that it's going to do is how those lands are used. And part of that equation has to be age-friendly developments. It's a better mix of median density development that would be uh, townhouses, small apartment buildings, the sort, of, the sort of housing that many seniors want to downsize into. The other issue is, the city working cooperatively with the group that's already out there that's looked at what, uh, what can be done in the city, the very businesses, to make them more senior friendly. There's a number of ways to do that, and you'll have to talk to me after as to what that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris. Is it me? Yes, it is you. Is it me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you just a Taco Fest, which is a fundraiser for the ring. And the River Council on Aging on Sunday. Um, it is their only fundraiser. I hope that I saw some of you out there to assist in that. Um, also, we had a tour on Monday for the Grand River Council on Aging, which was uh, taking three bus loads of individuals around to see the services within the municipality to get a better idea. I'm very much in tune with Lucy Marco's uh, uh, <laughs> go, go, slow, go, no, go. It frames just about everything that I think about. Um, so if you've heard her speak about that, you'll have an understanding of it. Housing is a very important issue for us. Um, we just put in place the John Noble Home, uh, a new complex of the John Noble Home, which is um, state-of-the-art, allows for independent living. We can create other opportunities for independent living as well. Transportation and mobility is one of the biggest issues that we hear uh, from seniors, being able to, whether it's buses, uh, Brantford Lift, uh, whatever other form of transportation is going to be able to be there. Keeping a sense of independence is very important for seniors for as long as possible. And healthcare is the other access why we need another hospital. Thank you very or much. And now we turn to Michael. I think um, looking after the elderly is a prime responsibility of the family. My wife and I did care for our elderly people until the last minute. No one can provide the love, the dedication of a son or a daughter to the parents. And we tried to keep them as long as we could and serve them with passion and love. Now, if I want to look at affordability, I am I'm not that old yet, but I'm old enough to start looking uh, for an apartment now. Unfortunately, Brantford lacks high rises and affordable apartments. And we should build those and care for the elderly. Thank you very much, Michael. John, this is the last one. In 1984, I financed the first time bank software called Lex, which allows single parents to log on what nights they can double duty babysit each other's kids and pay each other with one hour bills. Well, the biggest successful Lex is in Japan, 
called Furiyu Kiku, and it helps old people. If you put in time in your time bank, taking care of an oldster, reading to him, taking him to the store, taking him to the doctor, cleaning his place, later on, you can call on those hours to take care of you. Over half the people in Japan belong to their health care time bank. So, rather than be a volunteer and get nothing, get credit for your time, like the smart people in Japan do. Surely we can be smart too. Thank you very much. And now I have some questions that have been handed in from the audience. Obviously you haven't had a chance to prepare for these, so here we go. The first question is, why is there so much emphasis on we must grow? Will not any extra revenue be, uh, be eliminated by the cost of new infrastructure? Will not any extra revenue be eliminated by the cost of new infrastructure when we grow? The first person to answer is Wayne. Well, like we said, I said in the past, like the, the, near the beginning of the meeting here, that uh, we are a few years behind, like 24 or 30 years on everything. That's all I have to say. Now, if you uh, look at, uh, at the way the meetings were held in the past, and um, the, all the elections were held in the past, you find many repeats on many issues. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn to Michael. Planning, planning, and more planning. We have to anticipate the growth of the city. And we have to uh, be proactive and prepare for it. People coming to live in Brantford, of course, I was one of them. I came here 10, 12 years ago because it's an attractive place to live. And I thank Chris for that too. So, uh, <laughs> uh, if we plan uh, our growth, we, will ex we should expect more people to come and we can cope with the expense by, you know, we've got more people coming in. We're collecting more taxes, we have more revenue, and we could cope with the expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Any extra revenue that we receive within the municipality, and this is where people start talking about urban sprawl. Um, we do get ourselves into situations in municipalities with urban sprawl. And it is where we are away from our services, away from transit, away from logical locations for services to be, um, and that we separate individuals from the community as a whole. We don't have to do this in the north, uh, the new North Brantford, because we have the opportunity to partner with developers and have the philosophy which we've espoused throughout the entire boundary adjustment process, which is growth pays for growth. We have to, so we have to partner with the private sector to be able to see that first initial development. Uh, bringing the lands in. To be honest, I don't agree with the targets of the province except for our community or many of the communities that uh, are in the greater Golden Horseshoe. Uh, they're unrealistic and really basically focused out of Toronto and done without any understanding or relationship to what the culture or the nature of a community is. Brantford will be affected by 63,000 people coming to our community and it's unfortunate the province never listened to us. Thank you, Chris. And now Dave Rebell. Intensification for residential. Build inward and build up with caution on up. Our current city hit its targets for intensification at 46%. The province had a target in this period of 40%. We as a municipality, and I sat and watched that meeting, we didn't raise the banner and the bar to 50%. We took a back seat backwards to 40%. I watched that pass by council. If we're going to intensify a community, let's bring the numbers up and push up. We did it so far to 46, 6% 6 above 40. But where do we start after that? Let's start on industrial development. Why? Because industrial takes the lowest cost for development but yields the highest rate of tax return that we can put back into other infrastructure and development within our community. We can limit urban sprawl on residential while we focus on industrial for jobs, 
for people like you and me every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. John is next. I would deter growth. If you understand exponentials, 1%, the law of 72, your money will double in, 12, in 72 years. And at 2%, four times Bradford could be bigger. If it grew at 3%, eight times it would be bigger. If it grew at 5%, 32 times the size it is now. And if it grew at 10% a year, that's a thousand times bigger than it is now. That's how big a city will grow in one lifetime, 72 years. So when they talk about one, two, three percent, doesn't sound like much, but it's double, quadruple, octuple the original size, and it gets worse. So we don't need more growth. We actually have to deter growth to keep it as sustainable as possible. So I would do my best, my best, to try and keep growth down because it's just too dangerous when you're dealing with exponential functions that double and double in time. Thank you very much, John. And finally, Kevin. Right, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding the question, but if it's a question of growth or no growth, I'm absolutely in favor of growth. If as a community you're not growing, you're stagnating, you're declining, you will likely reverse all the success you have in the past as a community will begin to reverse itself. So growth's important, but it has to be managed growth. And so when I talk about managed growth, I say to people, look, the way we've used land the last 50 years in southern Ontario is not on anymore. We have some of the best farmland in the world. We have to use our land more wisely, and that does mean more intense development. So the boundary lands, we have to have a better mix of medium density. That would be townhouses, small apartments, etc. Plus, you know, we've got the we have the opportunity to, to develop within the city through infill. There's lots of opportunities within the city to infill. It's cheap to do that. The infrastructure is already there. The problem is NIMBYism when you're dealing with infill. I think we have to help the community understand Southern Ontario in the next 50 years, we're going to have infill. It's got to be compatible. Thank you very much. Okay, that was that question. The next question is a totally different topic. Drug problem questions. And there are two parts to this question. There is a large drug problem in Brantford, and what are your plans to address this issue? And B, what is your position on safe injection sites in Brantford? The first one will be Michael. What's the first uh, part? Of the, the first part was how would you address the drug problem in Brantford? And the other part of it is uh, whether you support safe injection sites in Brantford. No, I answer the second part. No safe injection um, sites. sites. Uh, I'd rather uh, take the drug addict and try and rehabilitate, rehabilitate uh, that addict, uh, treat them, uh, and not uh, help them uh, with a safe injection. I mean, I'm against uh, drugs, period. So uh, if uh, we try to help them by hospitalizing them, and uh, trying to uh, help them get rid of that habit, that would be the solution. Uh, and if we help them that way, we will eliminate the drug problem as well. Thank you very much. Would you like to hand it over to Chris now? Having this conversation at AWOL last week, which is the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and I'm sure the larger the caucus, and the larger the caucus members who were there were discussing uh, addiction to mental health in their downtown. There's Guelph, London, Sault Ste. Marie, Richmond Hill, Windsor, uh, Thunder Bay, all of them having the discussion. And what was interesting was it was the city of Guelph uh, councillor who was the first person who made the comment that we, we just can't seem to be able to manage what's happening with drugs in our community right now. Um, that opened up the gate for everybody else to start to say, we're actually moving tent cities. We're uh, dealing with uh, overdoses on an irregular basis. But really this has happened in a very short period of time that we've seen this increase. 
We put in place a drug strategy last year uh, that was a multi-organization drug strategy. It is comprehensive. It's been accepted by all the councils uh, in the immediate area, so it wasn't just for Brantford. It included Brant. Take a look, uh, have an opportunity to read it. It really is important that we deal with multi-group partnerships. I am not in favor of injection sites. I find that when we create these kinds of opportunities in communities um, uh, like ours, that there is so much anti or nimbyism that goes along with it, it is almost ineffective. Thanks very much. And now Dave. Drug problem? Huge. You spend a few hours in downtown, that's one thing. You spend a couple of nights downtown and you start to realize how rampant the problem is just in our downtown core in our community. So you have to tackle that issue. That is about taking back the night. This isn't just about police. This is about police services. This is about community services. It's about a community uniting and dealing with those individuals who bring the drugs into our community. As part of that drug problem, we need to provide appropriate care, not just a methadone clinic that if you piss dirty, you get more meds and you come back in a vicious cycle without programs to provide care for the mental health and drug addictions that are there. Those all have to work in unity in order to solve part of that drug problem. As for safe injection sites, I can tell you after the thousands of needles that I have worked with other groups to clean up and pick up, if those safe injection sites had the same amount of needles that we saw it on the street, it wouldn't be a problem with safe injection sites and value of them. Is there any real quantity of, of data that's available? We had an organization from another community here this week. They didn't have the data available either. They don't work as far as we're concerned. Thank you very much. John. Well, most of these people are getting high because they got no jobs. They got too much time. If they could work for bus tickets or tax credits, maybe they wouldn't have time to do chemical drugs. So the solution is jobs and free pot. Pot will get them off the chemicals. By next year, you will experience the benefits of herbal medication, herbal highs, herbal enhancement. You people think pot is like alcohol. Makes you drunk and stupid and barf on your friends. It doesn't. It enhances your performance. I'm an accordionist. You should see me when I smoke a joint first. <laughs> so, so, I'm going to try to say that by next year, you'll have more evidence about how herbal medication will be able to get a lot of people off your chemical addictions. And if you can match it up with a useful job, then there's almost no reason not to need the chemicals. But if they do, yeah, I don't want the needles in the streets. Give them a sight. Thank you very much, John. And next is Kevin. One minute for a question like this, that's tough. But first of all, there is a safe Bradford plan. It does have great goals in it, the four pillars, harm reduction, enforcement, education, and treatment. The problem is, like many other plans the city has come up with, there's no way to, there's no plan to implement it. We need to have a plan to move it forward. Safe injection sites. So, uh, I've lived with alcoholism. I've had two very close family member and a close friend that I became the point person for dealing with them. And what I learned is when you're addicted, you're not going to get help unless you want to get help. And you only get help when you hit rock bottom. And when you enable them, they don't hit rock bottom. They don't, they don't have any motivation to solve the problem. That's the problem I have with safe injection sites. I understand that trying to avoid the harm but it's almost enabling, it's almost accepting it as something that is okay. That's the problem I have with safe injection sites. I realize they can be a very effective conduit into treatment, and so if I was to consider a safe injection site, that would be the only circumstance under which I would do it as a mayor if it's very closely connected to a rehab option, a particular residential detox facility. Thank you. And it's also not uh, committed by the provincial government at this point, so it's all I can do. Uh, 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 thank you. I've sat in these many meetings uh, all through my years. Uh, this is uh, so simple. The uh, drug and alcohol testing program that was passed by uh, it was me that had uh, formed that uh, tradition uh, to put that in place of the worker place. Uh, for many reasons, there has been many callbacks on the food food industry. There's been many cars back on the vehicles, and uh, there has, uh, like there's, like I said, I deal with uh, uh, Toronto, London, 
I deal with Toronto, London, uh, up in uh, Alberta, and all those places, Calgary, and uh, it's just it's horrible. Huh? When they had uh, announced they were going to be passing this marijuana, like uh, in 2014, they had taken the uh, purple cigarettes right out of the, uh, the herbal store. They smelled like marijuana. Um, the uh, the treatment for the uh, cancer people. Um, Thank you very much, Wayne. Okay, now we have another question. As you know, there have been lands annexed from Brant County. Uh, what is your vision for these lands? How do you propose to use these lands, the new lands that have been annexed from Brant County? The first person to answer will be Wayne again. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, as I repeat myself, uh, 14, uh, uh, 20 or 30 years behind, uh, well, we have to use those lands very wisely and uh, carefully plan things out how we have to uh, uh, move forward. We can't be repeating and setting things back like it has been uh, for the last past while. It's not funny at all. Um, anyways, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Dave. There's a large area of land that needs to be covered off, but I want to look at the overall package needs to be broken down. Summer's in around 45 to 50 percent industrial base, and summer's around the 50 55 percent residential base. The reason for the heavy industrial base. We need to find our community in a mix that somewhere's around the 60% residential, 40% industrial, or more realistically, 70% residential, 30% industrial base. That shifts the tax burden from you, the residential ratepayer, over to the industrial commercial ratepayer. Now, the lands east of, of uh, Garden Avenue, slate for industrial. At the other opposite end, uh, on Powerline Road, slate those lands for industrial. The lands in between become residential. They'll be held back until such times as we get some industrial on stream. The last thing I want to see is additional tax burden of services on our community to you and the folks of your family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, the area that we're looking at is going to be a combination of uh, industrial, residential, commercial, and institutional, which means we're going to see the same kind of development or the same structure of development that we see in the southwest, but in a very different form. We've already got the services up to the highway um, for industrial. That's going to be the first area because growth pays for growth and industrial can pay for the beginning of residential. Um, we have the opportunity to rebuild the Home Builders Association or Home Builders within our community, which has really suffered over the last number of years without having any land. But we can do that in these residential lands. They have the opportunity to develop new people, to draw more people back into, um, into the trades, particularly in home building. Um, we need low impact design development in, the, in this entire area, whether it's industrial, commercial, or residential. Low impact design is meant to start to deal with the environmental concerns, climate change, Etc. There's wonderful um, communities that are already being developed with low impact design. We can make this environmentally uh, responsible. We should be anticipating change, and if, because it's contiguous with the city, our servicing will be easier. Thank you, Michael. Driving the streets of Brantford, you go through parquet after parquet with beautiful flowers and trees. I would like to maintain that all through the uh, annexed lands. I would also would like to have an industrial area for a project that if, hopefully I'll become the mayor, I will use to attract more jobs. I will be talking about this in my closing speech. Of course, Cranford is uh, growing and we will have to allocate part of that for the residential purposes. Particularly, I'd like to see high-rise buildings where you do not use much land, but you can have higher number of occupants. Thank you very much. John? Well, 
in furthering my idea that I don't like development, I don't want development, I would use that land for corn and tomatoes and pot, farms. Okay? That's all I can think of. By the way, I stand up because I don't want to whack Wayne or Dave in the head. And I've done that before. So, <laughs> so anyway, no, I mean, honestly, I don't have any opinion on what should be done with that land. But I like the idea of cheaper food and cheaper pot. Thank you very much. And finally, Kevin. <laughs> So these boundary lands are critical to the success of our city. That's where the new employment lands will be. That's where the new housing will be. West Brand is going to be built out in about three to four years. There's very little land left in the city other than infill for new residential. Uh, in terms of employment lands, we have only very small parcels of land for businesses. So we need that land. We need it on stream. We need it on stream developed as quickly as possible. Otherwise, we're going to have housing will become very expensive for our young people. So, but what do I want to submit my vision for? I get it very excited. You heard a little bit about earlier. This is land that we're going to have to use more wisely. There'll be more medium density construction that they call that the missing middle. That's the apartments, townhouses that provide an affordable housing option for young people entering the market, seniors downsizing. The other issue is you've got Fairchild Creek in that whole area. There's a lot of that land that's very environmentally sensitive. And so low impact development is critical. There's aquifers underneath that property, extremely valuable. Low impact development takes the water and recharges the aquifers down below. That's critical. We developed it wisely. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, now we move on to our fourth question from the floor. And it has to do with homelessness. What will you do to relieve the emergency shelter crisis in Brantford? What will you do to relieve the emergency shelter crisis in Brantford? The first one to answer is John. Well, I think I've already explained that, right? I would pay the homeless with bus tickets, and I would let their landlords pay their taxes with bus tickets, too. So the landlords have a reason to let these guys move in. So you can't just keep forking out cash from your pocket to keep these people housed when they're ready to work. Just like all those kids are ready to work. They want to work. They want to be useful. There's a lack of money for paychecks to let them be useful. But by thinking outside the box, creating a community currency. Do a Google search, community currency. It's in 10,000s of cities by now, since I started it in 84, 36 years ago, 34 years ago. So, if they can do it all over the world, use community currencies, why can't we do it here? But if we do it big, with a municipality backing it up, so that these tokens are good both for buses and taxes, Everybody will take it, just that can give you money. Thank you very much. Kevin. Yeah, so far as uh, emergency housing is concerned, the recent decision made by the city to reallocate the money that it has available for emergency shelters, uh, th that decision left a lot of the service providers the Welcome Center yesterday in particular befuddled. There didn't seem to have been a very transparent, consultative process there should be. But the general nature of this housing issue, you know, this was downloaded in the municipalities 10, 15 years ago. It's tough to meet this need from a property tax base. Fortunately, the federal government has said they're going to roll out a $30 billion, I believe that's what it is, housing program next year. Uh, to, to address this issue, I think it's critical that we work with our housing department to try and access as much of those funds as possible because we can't make a really serious dent in this problem just on the property tax base. The other issue is working with community groups, similar to the Yastrich and other groups. But the one complaint I've heard from many people in the community is that the city doesn't work well with them and sometimes seems at odd with what they're doing. So to address this homelessness crisis, I think it's important that as a city we work in consultation and cooperatively with all uh, groups and charities that are involved in. Thank you, Chris. I'm sorry, but I have to disagree. The shelter review process that we passed last night was a very transparent process. We took it through uh, council over the course of a number of months. Um, everybody was consulted through that process, and there was a partnership. We brought in an outside consultant 
to make it even more fair. That outside consultant came in with a more progressive, uh, proactive approach to homelessness instead of the reactive approach that, that was really built in the 1980s in this community. And we have to be able to move uh, forward. The idea behind our process now is to make homeless, homelessness infrequent, short duration and non-reoccurring. It needs to be multi-focused. We need to be able to focus on women specifically. Um, we need day programs because we can have somebody in a bed at, uh, at, for a night, but in the morning they're gone and they're being kicked out of everywhere that they were. In fact, I was downtown speaking with a number of individuals this week, and uh, they basically said, we just want somewhere to go, and the other guy said, I'm just tired of being robbed, man. And uh, we also have a new housing project on Marlene Ave, which directly addresses this particular issue on homelessness. Thank you very much. Dave. You know, I think to understand a little bit about the needs of the shelters, you need to spend not just a tour time, you actually need to spend some quality time with those homeless, these people. I've given up Christmases and Boxing Day with my wife and my daughter and my family to spend time with those people. They're people like you and I. They just have challenges. It takes more than a bed to help them. It takes services. There's an old cliche, if you will, or proverb. You can give someone a fish, and they will eat for a day. You can teach them how to fish, and they will eat for their tomorrows. Now, which the city has offered up 70 beds plopped in the middle of the Eagle Place for a solution. There's 150 possible suites in one hotel in Colbert and Second that kind of meets an area that would be helpful for those individuals. It gets them out of the downtown core, but it gets them away from heavy residential, and it's perfectly suited. 150 suites capable of doing almost 200 beds plus, and it has the ability to service those individuals as well. Thank you. Now, Wayne. There, I've uh, done uh, outreach work for uh, a while for so many years and everything for these uh, people. But the thing is, they keep on going on about their needles, their uh, drugs or whatever they're taking, but they don't look at it, gonna, they will be losing their places because of their behavior. Um, I spent a lot of hours in a uh, full year before I further the left the uh, government and the cities. Uh, because of there's, uh, there was a lot of issues going on with these uh, uh, street people. In Kitchener, they don't allow the needle users in the, the shelters in the wintertime due to the fact that they can do major damage or try to get somebody hooked onto this stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Michael. The easiest thing is to build more shelters. But is that the solution? We will keep building shelters? Of course not. I would look into the reason why are they homeless? Are, are they able to work? I could train them. If they are physically able, they could be trained to work, find jobs, and support themselves they won't be homeless anymore. So this is the question. Why are they homeless? Can I eliminate the reason for it? And the problem will be solved. And I have the answer yeah, right. to that question. And there's another question, and I'm, you're going to have a hard one time fitting this in with your <laughs> This has to do with bike lanes. What is your position on the expansion of bike lanes, and if you're in favor of them, where do you see them going in? If we have more bike lanes, where would they be? The first person to answer is John. I like the idea of bike lanes. If we can afford it, they can't. I can. Okay, thank you very much. That was sweet. Uh, let's have Wayne now. I think uh, the uh, bike line, uh, lanes are uh, sufficient in this community. The only reason is uh, because of the drivers, they, sometimes they uh, don't pay attention, they might run something off the, off the road, or it might be the opposite. Uh, you never know who is out there behind that wheel or on their bikes. But as for the bike lanes, 
That's very aggressive. Yeah, all kinds of pet names around here. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. I mean, we, we just had a question about the congestion we have in our roads. We don't have enough space for cars. Uh, we want to add a bike lane. I don't know how to do it. So... Uh, That's the lights. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it would be nice to have bike lanes and provide for the bikers, but... Uh, widening the streets to take the extra traffic would be the solution and then we could add the bike lane uh, and that's it I mean, uh, we, we don't have uh, our roads do not uh, cope with the current traffic so add the bike lane I don't know how to do it myself. okay thank you now Dave Rebell thank you I support the idea of bike lanes in our community, and I think there's a great way to handle it. Uh, Brentwood Park Road was one of the pilot projects uh, by, by Councillor Carpenter and myself as, as ward councillors in the day, and it was extended over to Dunstan, and I believe um, uh, North Park Road is also seeing it. It does take some time to adjust to, but as you're doing road reconstruction and road resurfacing, this is an opportunity for councillors and the mayor to engage with the residents to find the solutions that are best going to work. What we did in this particular case is we did first pave, set the lines, gave it a year, people adjusted, liked it, second paving, final lines. The only thing I would want to see improved is instead of white lines for demarcating uh, the bike lanes, let's do something that's in a bright green, it's used in other communities and over in Europe to identify. It's a healthier choice, which I agree with as well. If you can cycle from one end of the city to the other, that's good for you, it's good for our environment, and it's good for the community. Thank you. Kevin. Yes, I believe that uh, bike lanes make sense where it's, where it's appropriate. And there is a problem that, you know, with the, with the road allowance, we have many areas in the city, you're trying to accommodate pedestrians, parking, traffic. And there are many roads in the city where you just simply cannot do it. But where it can be done and you can still accommodate all the, in, the interests in using the road, great. And, in, and it's interesting, North Park Street, I mentioned earlier, there was a hidden benefit and that is it very much controlled the traffic because you have to move around and so controlled the speeding. So the other really good option is when roads are being reconstructed, building it in. For example, the Wayne Gretzky Parkway, that's probably the best bicycle lane that there is in town because it's separate from the roadway. And there will be other opportunities as we develop the boundary lands, as we develop a road link to West Brant, to be able to do that, to incorporate really proper bike paths into the entire bike path system that's along the river. And so that would be, but the core issue is, is there enough space where you really want the bike lanes to go? And that's the big challenge. Thank you. And Chris? The uh, North Park is the best example of bike lines, but it was originally proposed as a road diet. There's multi facets to it. So there are bike lanes, but there is also uh, using just simple, something simple as painting lines to change traffic patterns, change people's uh, drive or, or speed through those particular areas, and it provides uh, realistic and obviously marked parking for the residents in that area. So. We didn't know how it was going to be received immediately. Those who tear up and down that street up on a daily basis hated it. Um, the neighbors loved it. But I've walked around in some of the neighborhoods I can see uh, Balmoral, which is around the corner from where I live, is a perfect example of a community that could use a road diet and have uh, um, bike lanes on it. Fairview, the section from uh, the old Fairview School up until the um, uh, we get to where North Park is. There's another area that we can use to slow down traffic in that particular area. Memorial can also do this. Um, there are, these methods are used to get people to slow down traffic. And if you use bike lanes and get people to use bike lanes, I'm sounding like John Tramiel, then you get people out of their cars and off the roads. Thank you very much. Now before we go to closing statements, I think we have time for uh, the second question that was posed by the retired teachers. So I'm, I'll be using the, the order from the beginning, okay? Um, the question is, among the elderly, social isolation and abuse are a problem in every community. How would you identify 
and work to alleviate those problems in our community. Those problems being social isolation and abuse. First person to answer would be John. Are these one or two? It's it one sounds one. like a, one similar, minute. One minute. a similar question from before where I mentioned the Japan time bank, Furia Kipu, where if you help your neighbor for an hour, they'll help you back later when you need help. I mean, isn't that a complete solution? Why would 50% of all Japanese people belong to this? Why would they be helping their elderly? Well, if you help my mama, well then someone's gonna help, I'll help your mama, is what it boils down to. It's almost the same thing as babysitting swapping, but it's helping my mama swap. So, it's the same idea, it's the same software, I've been using the same idea to answer every single question, except the land use for the pot and for the crowd corn. But I mean, same answer again. The Furio Kipu time bank would allow the youth to take care of the old people and then be taken care of later. Thank you. Uh, Chris. Being recognized as a uh, age-friendly community by the World Health Organization only gets us to a point where we can start to identify the issues that we really want to tackle. Um, one of the issues that, that has taken on a great deal of interest, um, actually I see him sitting here, uh, Councillor Richard Carpenter, um, who has been leading the elder abuse program uh, process through uh, uh, our city council and um, has really put together, and the work that's been done has been put together is fantastic. The issue that we have to do is raise awareness, get education, and create funnels or communication uh, streams so that we can start to allow people to know that this is not all right. And one of the issues that goes on with it is that, particularly with elder abuse, from my understanding of this, um, that the, often the elder doesn't want to do it because they can't believe it's happening in, in those scenarios as well. Um, when it comes to social isolation, there are so many programs that are functioning within the city currently right now. Again, education, awareness, being able to go to people, draw them out. Lucy Marco's slow go, no go, or slow go, uh, go, I don't know. <laughs> go, go, slow go, no go, that's for Lucy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave from Bell. Sorry, Richard. Our community has been blessed with some great resources. Our Seniors Resource Center, Victim Services, our Policing Services, and our health agencies all work together to work and address and find solutions for our seniors with abuse. It's unfortunate that it happens, but it does. And when it does happen, we as citizens need to be educated to identify the symptoms that come with it. And that's the education component that these agencies and our municipality can work towards. I think it's incredibly important if we can recognize them, we can start to assist by putting these individuals in the right connections for their safety. As for getting seniors out into the community, let's work on our transit. Let's make things available to them that they can get out. And where they feel afraid or they feel fear in our community because it's unsafe, <coughs> let's break down the barriers and make them feel safe. A buddy program with our youth can be very, very important. SKIP, which is our Seniors and Kids Integration Program, what an amazing opportunity for our community, and as a city mayor, that's an area I want to put heavy focus on to help our seniors. Thank you. Kevin. <coughs> you know, on the issue of social isolation and abuse, I mean, there are a number of agencies that I'm aware of that are involved in respect in this issue. And so the, the issue, I think, for, from a city perspective is helping to coordinate that identifying where the gaps are and the services that are being provided in the city because much of this is funded by the province. It's not within the ability of a, of a city to actually fund this. So the role of the city I think is much like the mental health issue and that is you know your community, you identify the gaps you have in your community and you pressure the provincial government's representatives to address those issues through their programs and what they fund. The other issue is like neighborhood associations. I was really impressed with my canvas that with neighborhood associations, you're bringing an element of community to a lot of neighborhoods that don't have that. And when you look at socialization, isolation, much of that is due to the fact that we've broken down in this modern age, our communities and neighborhoods are breaking down. 
And so I find the use of neighborhood associations, which the city is really promoting as a great program, can be an effective tool to overcoming socialization, isolation. Just pronouncing that. Um, so again, it's really using what's out there, making sure as a city that it's better coordinated, and that the various that you act as a conduit and catalyst for groups about where to address this problem, rather than trying to do it yourself. Thank you very much, Wayne. Well, like I said earlier, this evening, there were many years behind. That's all I have to say. We have to start moving on. What's the hold back? Thank you very much. And finally, Michael. I grew up in an environment where respect to the elderly is a must. I would never question, never question my parents for anything. What they wanted, and if I could deliver, I did deliver. My mother-in-law lived her final 12 years in our house. We cared for her, her daughter, my wife cared for her, and we always, always made sure she was, she was a happy camper at home. She wanted to go to church on Sundays, I will take the time to take her to church, although, although I'm not that religious, but I will take her there. Similarly for my mother, who spent her last days in my house too. So respect to the elderly is something I grew up on, and it is a must. If we treat people like this, we will have no problem with the elderly. Thank you very much. This has been quite a long evening. Now, all that we do now is have closing statements from everyone, and the order that we'll do it in is the reverse of the opening statements, which means we start at this end of the table and work over that way. For the closing statement, we allow each candidate two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for being here tonight and listening to the voices of all these candidates. I want to thank our ladies here for opening the doors in North Park, for providing the venue. You know, I had some wonderful little speeches all prepared, and, and I just closed my books because I think it's important to recognize speaking from the heart carries a lot of weight. I have worked tirelessly for years. My parents raised me to do that, to work hard to earn an honest dollar. I get up every morning, and I go to work just like you folks. I earn a paycheck to provide for my family, to pay my bills and my taxes, every day, just like you folks. I put on my boots one foot at a time, just like you. My parents raised me to work hard, earnest hours. I instill that with my children. My wife instills that with her children because my mother-in-law is here today and that's the same values that they do. That's the same values I represented for three terms as an elected councillor for Ward 4. I worked cooperatively with my ward mate, Richard Carpenter, and the years that we served was one of the most effective and efficient ward representation in a long time. That's the experience I bring forward. I bring industry experience forward and connections to industry. I served students for 16 years at Mohawk College and I mentored them. My experience is relevant to the changing times in this community. They are relatable to all people of all generations. And they are current because I have served 20 years for this community. I don't give up. In 97, I ran as a candidate for ward councillor, and I stuck to it. In 2014, I didn't quit. I ran for mayor, and I'm back here today because that's the determination I bring. That's the experience I bring. That's the passion to this community. On October 22nd, Dave Robel for your mayor. Well, sadly, you're the couple of hundred people who heard about bus tickets being kids with bus tickets to shovel your snow. And therefore, there's a really good chance that no one else out there is going to hear about it. I'm expecting you to tell them. And therefore, you're going to end up shoveling your snow for the next few years. 
And guess what? No sunspots. Worst sunspots in a long time. We're going to have a mini ice age. So when you find yourself out there shoveling out those snow dunes when the plow goes by, remember me. But the good news is, by the in end of October, you'll be able to start experiencing neurogenesis, the creation of new brain cells, which is good for Alzheimer's and dementia when you take cannabis pot. So, who knows? By the time the next election comes around, you might vote to stop shoveling your own snow. <laughs> Michael? No, wait, sorry. Uh, thanks for coming out, people. You heard all the uh, candidates tonight. Um, I'm leaving everything up to the uh, the polling booths uh, for your uh, for your votes. It's only fair for you people to do your own voting, who you want in, and without the twisting the arms, without the hounding and uh, the door to door. I didn't do that. What I did was drop off a leaflet with a picture of myself and my pup which I adopted last uh, December from my abusive home and I took it in and the lady had passed away. I'm also a volunteer for the SPCA for the last past four years. So vote for Wayne Ma for mayor if you wish to do so. I'm not going to uh, twist your arm or anything. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. <coughs> Part of what makes Canada great is that our membership is based not on our bloodline, not on what we look like, what our last names are, not based on where our parents or grandparents came from, or how recently they arrived, but on adherence to a common belief that all of us are created equal. We are endowed by our Creator with certain undeniable rights. Under my leadership, I will adhere to this principle, foster amicable relations among all, work hand in hand with the county of Brand, and most definitely with the natives of the land. Coming from the business world, I will apply a proactive and not a reactive approach in running the city, where I anticipate the future and plan for it before it becomes an unmanageable problem. Banking on Canada's amicable worldwide relations, I will build a proven concept, a free trade zone, doing away with governmental bureaucracy and red tape that will attract businesses in drones. The only caveat is hire local, buy local, spend local, but sell overseas. In October, make the right choice and vote for me. I am Michael Issa. I am one of you. Thank you. Chris. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for putting this event together. Um, this, is all, this is the third of four debates that we're, we're having, which is actually the least I've seen in many years of elections. Um, I want to thank my friends and family, uh, Wendy, who's here, who came out to support um, this evening, and I appreciate all the hard work and dedication that you put into these campaigns, because nothing that we do, uh, nothing that I've done, uh, been able to accomplish as mayor, has been done alone. It's always been done with a team. And we've had amazing teams over the years. I said that I've been mayor for 17 of the last 24 years, and we've seen an incredible transformation, and that's the truth. I also am not shying away from the fact that I have been mayor for 17 years, and I want to be mayor for another four years, and probably another four years after that. I have always known that I wanted to be a politician, and I have always known that I wanted to serve uh, the community. And I had the opportunity at the age of 25 to meet a group of individuals who changed my life and we all changed our lives together. Um, to be able to uh, look at this community and say, at 25 years old, you don't have to leave to be successful. We can make that happen here. And I laid out a vision with the help of that team 
And with the help of an incredible group of teams afterwards, we've implemented that vision. We are at the stage now um, uh, in our success, with all of our success as a community, where we have the opportunity um, as a community to decide where we want to go, who we want to be as a community, like we haven't had in a very long time. I laid out that vision. I have the experience. I have the knowledge. And I still have the vision to be able to see where we need to go as a community to be able to make ourselves an exceptional living experience in the 21st century. On October 22nd, please, <clears throat> on October 22nd, please consider who your candidate is and vote for Mayor Chris Friel. Hey, funny. <laughs> Thank you, Nora, and the uh, CFEW for uh, putting this event on. You know, you, you've heard a lot of talk tonight from all of us, the, the, the way we want to make this city better, and I think we're all genuine about our commitment to that. I think we all want Bradford to be a thriving, a growing community that's an affordable place to live and a good place to grow a business. You've heard us talk about some of the challenges we face, whether it's dealing with the elderly, roads, sewers, etc. Um, but there, clearly there is something holding us back from the potential that we have as a city. You know, we've had tax increases the last four years that are twice the rate of inflation. That's an extra $10 million a year in spending. Do you feel like you've derived benefit from that $10 million? We have serious issues with mental health and drug use that are creating safety issues downtown. And although the current council has been good at creating plans, it's fallen short a little bit on the execution. It's necessary to get our shoulders behind some of those plans to move forward effectively. You know, as a lawyer, I've learned how to help people find solutions to their most pressing problems. In my private life, I've helped many charities and community organizations from across the city and from all walks of life. I've promoted economic growth, job creation, supportive programs, helping children, families, and our most vulnerable residents. As a member of City Council for six years, I learned how to work together as a team to accomplish some great things. So to realize the potential we have as a city, we need a mayor who will listen, who will work cooperatively with others, who is concerned about your taxpayer money, and who will lead a United City Council to deal with the issues we have today and prepare for a better tomorrow. That's the kind of mayor I want to be. That's the kind of mayor I'm ready to be. I ask for your vote on October 22nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would just like to make a personal note. I'm sitting here thinking of the news reports that I see from around the world where people get beaten up at the polls or where people actually get shot for their political views. It is really a privilege to be part of this tonight. I thank you, the audience, for being here, and of course our candidates for sharing their views in such a respectful way.